More than half a century ago, as the nation geared up to fight the greatest war in history, the world's rubber capital, Akron, Ohio, famous for making tires, shifted gears. One of Akron's companies, a decade earlier, had been a pioneer in lighter-than-air blimps and dirigibles, flying aircraft carriers for the U.S. Navy. Goodyear Aircraft Corporation now undertook the manufacture of heavier-than-air military aircraft. Adjacent to the giant air dock in which it had built the dirigible Akron, Goodyear broke ground in 1942 for a new factory in which it would make the FG-1D, the famous Corsair fighter. The new plant would be the length of five football fields with an adjacent hangar that would house 70 planes. The facility would be operational within a year after groundbreaking. A workforce of 10,000 would be needed to staff the new plant. But like many wartime industries, Goodyear soon encountered a shortage of machine operators since most young men were entering the armed forces and many were already overseas. So the company became a pioneer in training women for skilled technical jobs. Their ranks included dozens of deaf workers, which Akron has traditionally welcomed to its labor force. As production began, with the enthusiastic cooperation of its workers, the company established a very ambitious goal. Between 1943 and 1945, the plant built more than 4,000 Corsairs. Although Goodyear had been making aircraft wheels and brakes for 15 years, and aircraft tires since 1910, building entire fighter aircraft would be a brand new challenge. The Corsair was a state-of-the-art machine. Designed by Rex Beisel and Igor Sikorsky, it has been called one of the greatest combat aircraft in history. It had the most powerful engine and biggest propeller ever fitted to a fighter. It was the first warplane to exceed 400 miles per hour. To accommodate its 13-foot propeller, its inverted gull wing design was unique. It would outperform all other American aircraft of the time. The Corsair was built for the U.S. Navy and the Marine Corps, and it would be exported to Great Britain, New Zealand, and Mexico. Because the plane was designed for carrier use, its inverted gull wings were designed to fold up when stored below deck. Here at the Akron Airport, the first FG-1D was rolled out for its maiden test flight in February 1943. On early models, to save the weight of a battery and starting motor, the 2,000 horsepower engine was cranked by firing a blank shotgun shell. Less than 9,000 pounds, the Akron variant of the Corsair had a 40-foot wingspan and a range of more than 1,000 miles. Although it was unpressurized, the plane had a ceiling of 38,000 feet. The Akron Corsair was equipped with six 50-caliber machine guns in the wings, and it carried two 500-pound bombs. The Pratt and Whitney engine was equipped with water alcohol injection to produce a burst of extra power for up to five minutes, driving the aircraft 425 miles per hour. 
Because of the torque produced by the huge three-bladed propeller, the plane always tended to twist to the left during a stall. The following is a segment from a Navy training film of the time. For a carrier takeoff, you'll use about half flap, 20 to 30 degrees, with full power, while holding the plane with the brakes. Extreme caution must be observed to hold the tail down with the stick to prevent nosing over and digging the prop into the deck. With your flaps down, Tab settings are even more important to reduce the force needed to maintain your run and takeoff path. Six degrees nose right, six degrees right wing down, and about a degree nose up. After you have retracted the landing gear, when you have 110 to 120 knots, Bring the flaps up in easy stages, about 10 degrees at a time. This way you can control a flap failure and you won't lose altitude. You can maintain your altitude and climb. You can use your full takeoff power for a military climb of about 3,000 feet per minute. But after five minutes, you must throttle back to normal rated power for continuous operation, 43.5 inches at 2,550 RPM in neutral blower. With this power setting, your rate of climb will be about 2,000 feet per minute at a best climbing speed of 125 knots. At about 8,000 feet, you will have lost about three inches of manifold pressure. If you want to continue the same rate of climb, you must throttle back three to four inches of mercury, open the intercooler flaps, and shift to low blower. Increase your manifold pressure to 47 and a half inches and keep climbing. You can carry this power up to 13,500 feet, where again you will note a loss of about three inches of mercury. If you want more altitude, throttle back to lose an additional three or four inches and shift to high blower, followed by 48 inches of manifold pressure. Always keep your intercooler flaps about one half open when using low or high blower to maintain intake mixture temperatures within safe limits. A red warning light will indicate excessive temperatures and warn you to reduce power. Open the intercooler flaps wide and, if necessary, shift to a lower blower. Use automatic bridge for all your climbing and maneuvering. You're using a lot of power and if your mixture is not rich enough, there's danger of burning up the engine. Use a partial power climb if the tactical situation permits. Around 135 knots is about the best indicated speed. The cylinder heads have a rather high limitation, 260 degrees, and this should be used with caution. Oil temperature shouldn't exceed 95 degrees. Let's level off for cruising. In the combat overload condition, you can carry 344 gallons inside and 160 in the droppable belly tank, a total of 504 gallons. Refer to your pilot's handbook frequently for data on fuel consumption. If you use military power, you'll burn 275 gallons an hour. Rated power, over 200. Maximum cruising condition will be in automatic lean, 2330 RPM, 32 inches in neutral blower below 14,500 feet. This condition will burn about 100 gallons an hour. Recommended cruise is automatic lean, 2,150 RPM, 29 inches in any blower, using about 80 gallons per hour. You can cut your RPM down to 1,350 at 29 inches, 
and reduce the gas consumption to about 45 gallons an hour. With this low power, your two to one reduction gear will be turning the prop at 675 RPM and the Corsair will hum along like an oversized sewing machine. Burn up your wing tanks first. They have no gauges, remember. And begin with the left one. That's the wing which stalls first due to the torque reaction of the engine. Now that we've attained a safe altitude, let's explore the stall characteristics of this airplane. We're going to stall with power off in the landing condition. With the flaps at 30 degrees, She'll go at around 77 knots and go quickly. Regain control as quickly as possible and you'll run no chance of trouble. Stalls are abrupt preceded by very little warning in the nature of buffeting. Stick pressures are heavy, but with experience, you'll become familiar with the F4U's stall characteristics. In approaching a power stall in the clean condition, the control movements will be very small, and there is only a quick warning. At about 85 knots, there she goes, off on the left wing. Stick pressures are heavy. You can help them with your tan. Prompt, positive action results in a normal recovery. All right, let's put the wheels down and lower the flaps about 30 degrees. You'll want to familiarize yourself with her feel and behavior in this condition before you try any carrier landing. a few knots slower with an incipient spin to the left. Again, prompt action and normal technique bring about normal recovery. Now let's see how she behaves in a dive. The open cabin is not designed for speeds above 300 knots, so be sure it's closed before diving the airplane. Go through your checkoff list. To extend the landing gear for diving, don't use your landing gear control or you'll lower your tail wheel, which won't stand up to high speed. Lower the wheels with the dive brake control. This will leave the tail wheel retracted. Throttle slightly open. Mix in automatic bridge. Fuel tank on reserve. All flaps closed and you're ready to push over. Make your corrections early in the dive and don't let the engine rev at 3060 for more than 30 seconds. Don't exceed the speed and acceleration restrictions placed on this airplane by current technical orders. And don't exceed seven Gs in any loading condition. After World War II, the Corsair was used by the French in Indochina and later saw service in Korea. After it was modified to carry four 20 millimeter cannon and 4,000 pounds of bombs, which slowed the plane down to 240 miles per hour. As they rolled off the Goodyear assembly line during World War II, Ackland's Corsairs took off from the Ackland Airport for delivery to the Navy and the Marine Corps. New taxiways were built between the airport and the Goodyear plant. Between 1943 and 1945, 4,008 Corsairs took off for their destinations from the Ackland Airport.
The following scenes, archival footage from original training films, morale builders, and other memorabilia of the 1940s, recreate some of the atmosphere of those years. It was a very special time. Introducing four men, P.W. Litchfield, head of Goodyear's far-flung activities, Harry Blythe of that company, Colonel Tremlin of the Army, Lieutenant Commander Doherty of the Navy. They're looking over a scale model of one of America's amazing war industries, created almost overnight to meet the emergency of world conflict. Six months before Pearl Harbor, the huge airship dock stood all but empty with only 60 employees. Two years later, 30,000 men and women were working in a plant seven times as large. This is the story of Goodyear Aircraft Corporation at Akron. Let's watch this workman a minute. It's always a fascinating picture as hot rivets are tossed aloft. Perfect, right in the basket. The new buildings were quickly filled with machinery and equipment. This one to make wings and tail surfaces for the big Martin bombers. The structural steel workers held a little celebration as the last girder went into place. More buildings went up to make other plane parts and completed planes and dirigibles for the Navy. The steel workers had no more than moved out than crowds of new employees began to gather at the gates. Restaurants and hospitals, parking lots and cigarette machines went in. And in no time there were thousands of people working. Akron quickly got used to the novelty of girls in industry. Let's take a look through, starting with the airplane division. A large amount of engineering work is necessary in designing airplanes. This is one of the several drafting rooms serving the assembly lines. Before long, there were a number of women working at the drawing boards, taking men's places there as elsewhere. Now there's Tilly McKenzie from South Carolina at the right, and Ann Harrison with a slide rule. She's from Texas. As men were called into the armed forces, women went into the factory too, until there were as many there as there were men. Now here is a 19-year-old girl running a bandsaw expertly, as if she had been doing it all her life. The metal she is cutting is now part of a fighting airplane. Housewives with sons in the army gave their boys wholehearted support at home, helping to build the equipment they needed to win battles. Now a cable splicing, for instance, is a job for nimble fingers. And these women are putting their hearts into it as well. Bombing crews in the South Pacific, in Alaska, and in the Mediterranean can be proud of the workmanship on these jobs. Girls fresh out of high school and young wives whose men folk are overseas don slacks and learn to handle a riveting gun and a welding torch. This girl is helping to operate an electric welder. Now here is one of the most interesting groups in all of aircraft. The silence, as they are called, who can neither speak nor hear. They make excellent workmen, for when they talk, they must for the moment stop working. Scores of them went into the plant. Now these aren't curlers for anybody's hair unless it's Hitler's or Hirohito's. They are clamping parts together, ready for drilling and riveting. And we see some drilling operations. These girls are using a flexible drill. Here is a fairly complicated tool, a turret lathe. It was always thought of as a man's job, but this housewife seems as much at home as if she were in her own kitchen. And here's another. The adaptability of American women is one of the most striking things that came out of this war, even though most of them had never been inside a factory before. Wheels and brakes are made in aircraft. Goodyear, a rubber company, got into this field which uses only metal by accident. The company brought out an airplane tower in 1928, 
so revolutionary that everyone said it wouldn't work. So the company had to build wheels to fit it and presently brakes as well. Engine nacelles and landing gears are built into the wings. Huge presses like this take the metal sheets and form them to the exact shape they're to have in the finished plane. These presses can do the job much faster than men with hammers. But the presses had first to be built and dies cut for them. So America had to go through a tooling up period with the result that we got started rather slowly. But once the machinery of production began to roll, we built up a fleet of 100,000 planes in 18 months. These drop hammers are doing an interesting job. If we could build airplanes like houses with square or beveled corners, it would be lots easier. But the airplane contour is always a curving one in order to lessen air resistance. And even a small piece of metal like this may have to be bent in two different directions at the same time. All of the many parts which go into the Martin wing finally come together for a preliminary assembly in this forest of jigs. We move in closer and find the forest full of people. Now we see something that begins to look like a plane. And by the way, the reflection isn't bad either. Older women throughout the plant are setting the example for the rest. A lot of them have service stars in their windows at home. Leading edge and trailing edge move into final assembly. Their are burnished sides making a pretty picture. Here a wingtip goes into place. Notice the sign, this wing must be moved today. Yes, time presses in an airplane plant. And here at last is a finished wing ready to be shipped out. The rays from the afternoon sun light briefly on it through the open door. And Edith Doyle, who used to be a Tennessee school marm, writes a V on it. And the gang gives a cheer. The V is for victory. Here's where the single-seater Corsairs are built for the Navy, the best fighters in the Pacific area. Production was underway and the first plane finished just one year after the building was started. And here's a row of engines. 2,000 horses in each of them champing at the bits. Now the paint shop where colors hard for the enemy to see from above or below are straight on. Now comes an important day, the first test flight of the first FG-1. Yes, that's its official name. F for fighter, G for Goodyear, and the one means the first of its class. The plane is towed across the airport. The Corsair tries out its wings, folds and unfolds them, for it must operate from carriers where space is at a premium as well as from land bases. Homeward bound aircrafters stop by, sensing something about to happen. Test pilot Stevens comes across the field in his scooter, parachute in place. The mechanics have checked the controls and warmed the engines. Stevens climbs aboard, adjusts his helmet, and taxes down the runway to take off. Here she comes. The Corsair picks up speed, is off the ground in an amazingly short time, even at part throttle. And here's the way the ship looks in the air. The pilot pulls up the landing wheels. Whistling death, the Japs call it. No stunts on this flight. A few slow rolls, maybe. But this is what the Navy calls the shakedown flight. You wanted to see that all parts and controls are working smoothly. Steve stays up half an hour, then signals the control tower he's ready to come in. Swings easily earthward through the clouds. The plane comes to a stop quickly. It is designed to do it, flat tops, and on improvised runways in the jungle. Steve swings back to the starting point. Signals the ground crew, okay. It's a good ship, he says. He sheds his parachute, gets out, and is greeted by Art Chapman, his second in command, and Lieutenant Tom George of the Navy. It's a historic moment. Goodyear had built airplane tires since 1910, wheels and brakes for 15 years and now in the emergency of war had built its first complete plane. Corsair 1 finished its first test schedule in a few weeks and was ready for delivery to the Navy.
By that time, more new planes were ready for test. That is the part of the magic of American industry, that in so short a time, a company new to the business of plane manufacture was already in production. One newly hatched Corsair swings around facing us, its wings proudly aloft like the fighting cock it is. The first delivery is without fanfare. Planes must be sent away as fast as they are ready. Stevens escorts the young Navy ferry pilot over to the ship. He climbs aboard, will taxi across the field, then turn and fly back over our heads. The first of many flyaways from Akron Airport. And here he comes. He'll be in the Port of Columbus, 120 miles away, almost before we get back to the plant. And here are the people who are building these planes. The men and women, the young and old, skilled artisans and beginners. 